Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this special High Impact Tea virtual program. Uh, my name is Tim Kawahara and I am the Executive Director of the UCLA Zyman Center for Real Estate. Today's program is specifically being presented by the Zyman Center's Housing as Healthcare Initiative and is a joint program with Impact at Anderson. I would like to thank my colleague, uh, Bhavna Sivanan, Executive Director of Impact Anderson, uh, for the partnership on this special event. I'd also like to acknowledge Faculty Director Maggie Delmas and staff members Kelly Chung and Mia Antonio. Uh, just one housekeeping item, the Q&A dialogue will be during the last 10 to 15 minutes of the program, and I am to use the Q&A function to submit questions. So, <clears throat> real estate, the built environment, climate change, and public health are all interconnected. Today's program is focused on, focused on examining these issues through a multidisciplinary lens. These interplays are more timely than ever. COVID-19 has forced us to investigate the built environment, our homes, schools, workplaces, and neighborhood, neighborhoods, uh, and its impact on public health. And just last week, the U.S. officially rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement in a show of global solidarity and collective action to fight climate change. Hopefully this will all lead to more discussions like the one we are having today. We are extremely fortunate to have with us a truly world-renowned expert on the subject, Dr. Richard Jackson, to discuss the impact of climate and the physical environment and public health. Richard Jackson is Professor Emeritus at UCLA's Fielding School of Public Health, where he was department chair in environmental health sciences. A pediatrician, he has served in many leadership positions with the California Health Department, including the highest as the state health officer. For nine years, he was director of the CDC's National Center for Environmental Health and received the Presidential Distinguished Service Award. In 2011, he was elected to the National Academy of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, and since 2019, has been co-lead of the National Academy of Medicine's Health and Climate Interest Group. Dick Jackson has co-authored a few books, including Urban Sprawl and Public Health, Making Healthy Places, and Designing Healthy Communities, for which he hosted a four-hour PBS series. He has served on many environmental and health boards, as well as the board of directors of the American Institute of Architects. He is an elected honorary fellow of the American Institute of Architects and elected honorary fellow of the American Society of Landscape Architects. Dick has testified before the U.S. Congress and California legislature on many occasions. As my colleague Bhavna likes to say, he is a absolute rock star. So we are for, very fortunate to have him. So we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Jackson to the Anderson School for this event. Dick Jackson. Hi, Tim, and thank you. And I just want to make sure I did a screen share. Is it showing right now? It is. Wonderful. And uh, I, I guess I am a rock star because I showed up late and made people wait, and it's all my fault. <laughs> so, uh, and it's no one else's fault but my own. I somehow had, never mind, there's no excuse. These are two of the books and Typically enough for me, I've got too much in there, but I, I will go forward. A quick point about when I was teaching in the very first class, I required that it was half public health and half from other schools. And for the final project, sort of a capstone for the class, I asked that they partner with someone from another uh, department. And my favorite story is that um, a young woman from public health wanted to do it. Uh, project on violence against women and the young man from urban planning wanted to do something on transit oriented development. Uh, they couldn't get along for the first couple of weeks, but then he figured out that she wanted safe lines of vision and safety, um, stairways, uh, doorways, etc. Um, and that he, she did not realize, we public health people, that everything we were looking at was in somebody's mind at some point in the past. And so, uh, they ended up getting married. And where I'm going with that is that um, really public health and planning and architecture were married back in the days of Vitruvius 2000 years ago, but also uh, even now and need to be even more so. I loved your logo, um, Housing as Healthcare, and I'm going to talk a fair amount about um, my thinking about real estate. And I welcome people to push back at me. Uh, I'm going to go through this in about 30 minutes, so we'll, there'll be time at the end. Uh, as I was preparing this talk, and it was hard because, um, and I don't mean this arrogantly, uh, you get to a certain age and you just want to talk about everything and condensing it down to a reasonable and interesting discussion has been hard. But I, I thought a lot about the mission of medicine, but what is the vision and mission of real estate in the United States? Well, 
I'll come back to that. But um, back when the American Public Health Association was started, uh, and about a third of those people were planners, bankers, uh, a third of them were docs, uh, physicians, and but the idea that the built environment was linked to people's health was perfectly obvious. And without knowing about bacteria, without knowing about viruses, people knew that if people lived in desperately bad housing situations, rates of uh, tuberculosis and other diseases, if you drank bad water, you had more diarrhea. Uh, and, you know, the chief cause of death in the old days was um, uh, it was infant deaths because of bad water quality, bad food quality. But this is what it was. And, and this is percentages back uh, 120 years ago. Um, these are the 10 leading causes of death in the prior uh, decade. And you can see that heart disease and cancer are the big leaders. And you all know the antecedents to heart disease uh, include, you know, there's some congenital where we have a predisposition to, some of us have bad arteries or bad valves, but some of us have, um, we're either smoking or have bad diets or we're too inactive. Cancer has the same set of things. And you can see that it's changed. Although I will say that in the last eight months, the leading cause of death in the United States now is COVID. And I'll welcome a discussion on that during the Q&A as well. You all know that a key part of the 20th century prosperity in the United States, and you know we went from a prosperous, uh, middle rank country to one of the most prosperous countries in the world by using the immense amount of energy that was embodied first in coal and other, uh, then moving on to oil as the fossil fuel. And then the um, economic engine was the automobile with steel, but then gasoline and roadways and bridges and other such things. And it was so much an engine of the United States and it was really critical. Uh, the, our industrial might was critical to the winning of World War II. And uh, one of the major cities that drove all of this, and it's been in the news for a lot of reasons, you know only too well, was that of Flint, Michigan, Michael Moore's hometown. The biggest factory in the world was the Buick factory in Flint, Michigan, back in around 1948, 1950. Um, the city had about 200,000 people. It was extremely prosperous. Everybody pretty much had a job, but the era of the automobile American-made automobiles uh, began to move out. Companies searched for um, non-unionized uh, places. Uh, foreign competition came up, and the city cut its population in half. And we've all know the story about the Flint water, and I won't get into the political mess that uh, drove, um, you know, it was just crazy to draw water out of the Flint River for drinking water. This was a, was a disposal area for 100 years. But um, and but the other big driver was the fact that by having the population and removing those factories, this immense water delivery system that was designed, for example, to, to supply that Buick plant suddenly was supplying only about 95,000 people. And it meant that water was sitting in the pipes for long periods of time. And some of the pipes were lead, but men, and the service laterals were lead, but many of them had solder in them. And probably the homes of many of the people listening have soldered uh, elbows and corners in those pipes as well. So the stagnancy of the water reflects the stagnancy of the economic situation, the loss of population, and really was a big contributor to health. Tim, you mentioned I'm a pediatrician, and uh, I remember I had a chance to, during a summer project, to work on the wards at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. And I remember being there and going on the ward and seeing, and I'm not making this up, about 20 little kids as hyperactive as could be running up and down the halls. And I said to the attending physician who was precepting me, I said, what are they doing here? They look fine. They, why aren't they home? He said, oh, they're being chelated for lead poisoning. They were having chemicals put in their blood, uh, EDTA and other chemicals, to pull the lead out of their body. And, and these chemicals avidly attracted to any a metal that was plus plus, which p lead, PB, is plus plus a divalent cation. So it's pulling iron and calcium and other elements out of them. And I said, well, you know, what's it? 
how, what's the definition of toxicity? He goes, well, over about a blood lead of 60, and I got mine tested, and it was 22. So I figured, and it was the same as the average American. I, oh, I figured I'm fine. You know, I don't have any harm from lead compared to these poor children. And the poor children were coming from homes like this one. Uh, the, and I'll talk a little bit about the um, quantities of lead paint that were um, put on uh, homes uh, through the, particularly the first 35, 40 years of the United States. And it then would uh, peel off. Uh, if you see alligatoring paint on a porch or something else, that is almost always lead. Lead's an element. It doesn't biodegrade. It's not like um, some of the other chemicals that we use or volatile organics. It stays there forever. And lead tastes good. The Romans actually caulked their wine casks with lead because it had a t sweet taste. And painting friction sur surfaces, for example, a windowsill with lead paint and a toddler, and you all know toddlers go along and everything goes in their mouth. Here's a, a baby licking a windowsill. It's clearly not lead painted. They probably couldn't even legally get the picture. But um, kids do this, and it was a wonderful way to do a terrible way abundantly obvious way for lead to be delivered into children. Here's the amount of lead that was being produced in the United States and used in paint. And from about 1900 to 1930, lead paint's great. It washes off completely. It suppresses mold because that's toxic. Um, it was, uh, it made colors brighter. And I calculated for this talk, we were producing each year two pounds of lead in paint for every person in the United States. And if you picked up a gallon of lead paint, it actually felt heavy because there was so much lead in it. And lead is cheap. It works um, really well. And it's often a byproduct of gold extraction and silver and other metals. So it's pretty easy to come up with lead and you can burn down or cook down batteries and other things that have lead in it and put it into the uh, channels of trade. Here's from a museum in Arles, France that um, you know, in the process of making the museum, they dug up Roman pipes that were made of lead. Vitruvius himself, the father of architecture from 100 years ago, said the best way to move water was either through masonry, you know, the aqueducts, or through lead pipes. Um, you know, sometimes they used empty logs, but they didn't last very long. It did not degrade in the environment, and it's very absorbable. And I'm going to go back to that two plus. Your body, your grandchild's body and your grandchild's body is avidly in just uh, going after a bunch of two plus metals, one of which metalloid, which is calcium. You need a lot of calcium to grow your muscles, grow your brain, of course, grow your your uh, bones and teeth. Iron you need for your blood, Fe to plus two. And so these are nutritional needs. And if you are deficient in those, it's one of the reasons poor kids were more of a risk from lead paint is you're going to absorb, you're much better at ingesting. Half of the you get is going to go into your bloodstream. Here's a picture of a lead soldered pipes and virtually all pipes were lead soldered till about 1900, 1990. So um, if water sat in the pipes and the mantra then was run the water in your pipes before you drink it so you get the lead out. And that was true of faucets as well. Lead was so abundant in the environment. And um, this is kind of an awful story, but I was born in the 40s and my siblings in the 50s. And the, if a mom couldn't nurse, they made formula at home using evaporated milk. Most of you have tasted evaporated milk and the cans were sealed with lead solder. There was a bump on the top of that can. That, um, and that, so there's lead in the um, milk that we are feeding our babies. And I'll come back to this in a second. As I said, we thought that the blood leads over 60 were the only ones that were toxic, but we were seeing about 10 deaths a year. And I saw a child when I was in New York die of lead poisoning um, in each of our major cities. It was very common. And the hospitals had a lot of children being chelated for lead poisoning. That's a better picture because the paint actually looks like peeled lead paint. The political history on this is deeply informative. And I recommend to the listeners to think a little bit about this because the strategy that the lead industry used, it, anytime you can sell something that is cheap to get for quite a bit of money, the political power of that group to lobby, uh, do public relations and block legislation to hire the best, most expensive consultants they can to stop things 
was very powerful. So this was the, and by the way, that's true of the tobacco industry, which is dirt cheap to produce. And it was true of uh, fossil fuels. And back in the old days, you could put a well in Pennsylvania, um, go down 80 feet and have uh, oil being produced. So the power of these industries was substantial. Back in 1918, National Lead figured out that, P and, and by the way, the pediatricians in Australia had urged and succeeded in getting Australia to ban lead paint because of seeing sick children. They, uh, and the American industry was very afraid that this would happen in the United States. So the targeting of the marketing of lead, sound familiar? Was to go after children. How's your mother today, Alice? And the picture of the children paying, and by the way, uh, lead paint is quite resistant to scuffing and, and damage. Here's a coloring book for children that you can learn about. You color in the book and this uh, child, the Dutch boy, was how they were. There were other pictures of children painting with bright colors their toys with lead paint because lead was so good for you. Well, if, um, and it really was a, a very uh, successful marketing campaign. By about the beginning of the Depression, the we're moving you know the high quality uh, octane gasoline fuels were becoming more expensive there were so many cars on the road the engines were uh, more demanding and sort of order increase the efficiency of the gasoline in the engines it was discovered that you could add tetraethyl lead to gasoline and it would enhance uh, reduce knocking and enhance the uh, efficiency of lead and gasoline Look at that two and a half gallon, uh, two and a half grams per gallon of lead. That means if you fill up your car with 12 gallons of gasoline, it had at a molecular level an ounce of lead. And some of you that are fisher persons know that, you know, you've used lead weights at some point in your life. Think about that being dissolved in a very fine formula running through the engine of a car. Um, and this is a toxic material and spraying out to the environment at a molecular level. And, and by the way, we documented the children that were living in the lower floor, floors of homes and apartment buildings had higher lead levels than those living at higher levels. And of course, one of the things that happened, you, the younger people don't remember this, but toll takers in the tunnels in New York, for example, would develop lead poisoning because you actually had to receive tolls by hand. So this is kilotons per million populations of lead in gasoline in the United States. But something else happened by 1950, and maybe a lot of you folks aren't aware of it, but President Eisenhower, subsequent President Eisenhower, General Eisenhower, the Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in World War II in Europe, uh, had as a young man, along with George Marshall, man behind the Marshall Plan, had a mid-level officer during the 20s and they were in the army that broke up the veterans during their march for a, it was called the bonus march to get it it was the economics of these poor starving veterans after the war needing to get money from the government and eisenhower and marshall swore they'd never do that again eisenhower also observed something else because he had seen the autobahns in germany as they were invading germany uh towards the end of world war ii and realized that highways stood up to uh, bombing and other kind of attacks better than uh, railroads. The other thing, and, and this is why the national highway system was a defense system, was that the US government had placed nuclear production, development, and research facilities around the country, often in rural areas, and needed to move material very rapidly and quickly across the country. And yes, oh, by the way, it stimulated the economy and people could go to drive to see grandma much more quickly. It did mean the death of a lot of small towns as well. But the interstate highway system was a very complex mix. Uh, I always joke that this is a picture of uh, the California state flower and people love them. And you could, back when Disneyland was opened in 1955, uh, there's a picture looking at the Magic Mountain and over to the side you see, I think it was Highway 5 or 405, and there are only about five cars on it. Well, you know the last time that happened. Dear friend and one of my heroes, the earlier generation of pediatricians just realized that the kids that had recovered from lead poisoning had trouble. They had terrible attention deficit disorders, behavior problems. They came from homes like the one that my friend Herb Nealman is sitting on the porch of with peeling paint. 
And he did some of the very simple studies looking at reaction times. A child would sit at a desk and there would be a button there and uh, there'd be a red light in front of him. And as soon as it, maybe it was the other way around, as soon as it turned color, they were supposed to hit the button. And what he found, Dr. Needleman found, was that the um, reaction time was much slower. The kids were less vigilant and the reaction times were slower. The nerves were moving slower and the children had been lead poisoned. And this could have been two, three, four years ago when this occurred. He wanted to figure out what would be the deficit in children who had been poisoned. Typically, you know, it's toddlers. It's one, two, three, four years of age that get the worst lead poisoning. And now he's looking at, at you know, six, seven, eight. And he had to figure out what, how, what were their lead levels at that time. And what he did was um, he obtained teeth from the children. He, he would pay them a dollar and the children would bring in their tooth, teeth when they were age six. And he did an independent study looking at the gradation of more and more, and more lead in the children's teeth reflecting on what they were as toddlers and what, how were they re behaving in school. And, um, and these were independent ratings. The teachers didn't know about the lead levels in the kids. He standardized for mother's education and mother's smoking and other things. And this was a groundbreaking report from the late 70s. And people, it just blew people's mind because this issue was so, lead was so pervasive. And the higher the lead level in the, in the children's teeth, reflecting early exposures, the more distractible, uh, lower the overall functioning, more impulsive, more easily fr frustrated, more disorganized. And it really was a big push to begin to really finalize the removal of lead from paint, but also the, subsequently from gasoline. This is a mantra of pediatrics and children eat, drink and breathe three times as much as adults do for pound of body weight. Uh, they have about small children have three to four times the skin area, the surface area as an adult does for pound of body weight. And one of the fundamental tenets of pediatrics is, seems obvious, but wasn't true. People didn't realize it until the 60s. Children are not little adults. Uh, because of growth, because of nutrition and other reasons, and because of windows of vulnerability, uh, they are more likely to uh, su suffer from harm. Uh, I have the fun of watching my seven, eight year old, seven month old granddaughter developing language and the rapidity of it is just striking. But look how that window of language acquisition is so important between one month and one year of age. Um, you still can get language, but you think they're not paying attention. Every word is being absorbed by that little brain. They're integrating uh, vision and hearing at the same time. Cognitive function and behavior uh, begins to pick up over time. Although there are some people who think uh, that teenage boys never get it, uh, having been the father of teenage sons. But uh, I'm joking there. But the issue of these win these windows open and close, and you don't get another chance. By the way, okay, look at up there: 700 new synapses. Those are brain connections per second in the first years of life. It's amazing how fast the brain is growing. So the green bar and graph is. Uh, paint lead, and you can see how it declined during the 1930s into the 40s and um, with subsequent bans and removal. For a while, it was kept for bridge paint and other such things, but over time, it's been removed. Lead and gasoline kept going up and up and up. There was an orthogonal issue that was going on at the same time, and all of you that have lived in California, and actually in LA for the last uh, two generations, know that there are people you rarely could see the mountains from downtown LA. The smog was so thick. The nitrous oxide is what makes it more brown. And there was a big push to remove smog. It was burned the eyes, was uncomfortable. It made people feel sick. And a major contribution from a scientist at the California then Air Resources Board, or at least the Oakland Air District in LA, was the development of the catalytic converter. In the Q&A, we can talk about it a little more. But um, and the catalytic converter, you could not use it if you had lead and gasoline. So that was what actually drove the removal of lead from gasoline and removed so many of the common smog air pollutants from our environment. So I'd like to say that we pediatricians got rid of lead and gasoline, but in fact, the catalytic converter did as well. And look what happened to lead and glass gasoline, the blue line uh, over time. And it dropped 
up until about the 1990s, a lot of pressure to get rid of it. It's still in um, small aircraft gasoline. And so, but this is not academic. It's not that your eyes burn and it doesn't smell good and you don't feel good. Here's a terrific study out of USC where they took a large number of children and looked at their lung functions and about 7% of the kids in the late 90s had impaired lung function. And by just getting rid of soot, small scale soot, PM 2.5, it dropped down to about 3.5% uh, of the children. So improving the environment. And this is a powerful population study. People didn't know what they were being studied for. Look at the improvement in lung function. There's another sidebar I want to make here, which is that uh, you know, remember we defined lead poisoning as 60? Well, over time, we kept lowering the definition of lead poisoning. It annoyed the hell out of the lead industry, but we couldn't do studies of, you know, what was the difference in your functioning between a blood lead of five and a blood lead of 10 until most of the people had low lead levels. So then you could start discriminating these lower exposures and what were the impacts. Right now, the definition is five uh, for this. There was something else going on, and I, I spent um, 14, 15 years of my life at CDC, nine years as the Center Director for Environmental Health. CDC has these vans that go around the country and test, do lab test physical exams on 5,000 people a year. This is the gold standard because, you know, they get eye tests and weight and height and cholesterol and on and on and on. And so here's the NHANES data from about 1978, the average blood lead, I think this is adults now, I can't see the top of it, but look at how the average blood lead in the United States has dropped. It was thought impossible on the face of the earth in 1980 that anyone could have a blood lead under five. In fact, the lowest they could find was a blood lead of five, and now it's well under two. So what? You know, it's a little bit of lead. There's really no difference between a six and an eight, you know, who cares? But it really created, when you change the distribution, and this is fundamental to public health, when you change the population distribution and you move it down, in term, this is with IQ, but it happens with other things. Lead impairs IQ, by the way. If you move IQ down, um, you as a university person probably won't tell the difference between 100 IQ and 103 IQ in your students. But when you shift the population distribution, more individuals end up needing additional help or even medical help and much fewer people end up being in the gifted or highly gifted area. And by the way, I'll make these slides available, but don't use them commercially because I did do screenshots. For fun, I, I got my staff to do an estimate of what would be the economic benefits of reducing children's exposure to lead in the United States. And 10 IQ, 10 lead points micrograms per deciliter, calculate out to about two and a half IQ points. So, and people will say, well, IQ is socially and culturally biased. It, it is, but it also is a pretty good predictor of how well you do in school. If you do well in school, you stay in school longer and you have a higher income overall in your lifetime. The economic value of an IQ point, Jonathan Schwartz did this, is about $15,000. So, we calculated for an entire cohort of babies, which is about 4 million babies, each year's cohort is given the gift of a quarter of a trillion dollars in, in additional lifetime income because of not having that loss of IQ due to lead in their brains. And so when our kids tell us they're smarter than we are, uh, it's true. Um, because CDC, we had to go into very poor communities and look at lead, and, and but we were doing a lot of work overseas, Mexico, Russia, China, and so we developed this handheld instrument. This is the work we did in re getting rid of some of the smelters or at least reducing emissions in Mexico, But and this is the work we did in uh, Russia. I was the head of health and environment for Vice President Gore and in his negotiations with Russia, and we were able to do blood leads on the Prime Minister of Russia and Vice President Gore, and I won't tell you, but one of them had much higher lead than the other, and this led to um, this this led to the ban of lead and gasoline in Russia. The same thing happened in China, by the way. The Chinese are so efficient when it comes to it. They issued a redheaded letter across China, first in Beijing, 
uh, but then uh, China-wide to remove lead from gasoline. And it's been spectacularly successful there as well. So in my last five or seven minutes, I will tell you that the purpose of public health is not to give people orders, it's not to create the nanny state. It, is it to make people healthy? Yeah, it is. Um, is it to prevent disease? Yes. But society has an interest in having people healthy. And our goal in public health is to assure conditions where people can be healthy. So that's why sometimes you say you health people are imperialists because you're meddling in transportation, you're meddling in food policy, you're meddling in climate change. Well, damn it, we gotta be there. That's our job is to fulfill society's interest in creating conditions where people can be healthy. So I asked at the very beginning, what's the purpose of real estate? What's the mission statement here? And I pulled up on site many uh, mission statements um, here's one, we're going to um, make our customers loyal and get everybody to be satisfied and make our company better. But there really wasn't a big vision for real estate. Maybe there is. Um, I love the idea of advancing thought leadership, but I would love to see a lot more health inoculated into the thought leadership of everyone in real estate because they are major health entities. I don't have a slide to say this, entities. I don't have a slide to say this, but I hate the word amenities. And a lot of times in real estate, people are talking, they're talking amenity as being a school, a walking trail, a park, um, trees, uh, et cetera. I don't think those are amenities. Those are life essentials. And we st need to stop talking about them as something tangential and unimportant. I went back to CDC um, on my second round in 1994, uh, was sworn in. Um, and David Satcher was a, a wonderful leader to me and a friend. He subsequently became Surgeon General. He was director then. And uh, we spent time looking at asthma in Atlanta. We spent time looking at chemical weapon destruction in Anniston, Alabama, his hometown, by the way, where he was not hospitalized when he had whooping cough because he was a black child um, in Anniston. Uh, and this is an MD, PhD, one of the finest men you'd ever want to know. And we spent time in, in China, looking at folic acid and other interventions for health in China. And we spent time on the US-Mexico border. Oh my God, talk about the need for real estate and housing. It was really remarkable. One of the first epidemics we were called on when I arrived was the heat wave in Chicago. Uh, it says 500 deaths back in July of 1995. It turned out to be about 750 deaths. It was also an education because politically, a lot of people were saying, oh, it's not the heat that's killing people. It must be something else. It must be a virus. Oh, no. It was the heat wave and the fact that buildings were designed for winter, but they weren't designed for ventilation. They certainly weren't. They were did a good job at isolating people, but isolating yourself in a hot building with a fan running is one of the worst things you can be doing. And by the way, heat makes air quality worse. One of the early things that happened in my time at CDC was the realization that the obesity epidemic had arrived on the U.S. and um, here was obesity. We didn't even know it was going on in 1990, but here it is by the year 2000. It was almost code blue. We were scared to death. 24% of the adults now having being obese, body mass index over 30. But here is, I think, 2016. And you can see uh, the various states just going up and up and up, some as high as over 35% of the adults being obese. And here's the most recent chart I could get. <coughs> excuse me. Um, so the obesity epidemic has got a big driver. As obesity has gone up, diabetes has gone up. And so just what you would imagine, by the way, you can see it's much worse. Your diabetes risk goes up much more for women than for men with increase in your body mass. But here's 1995, 2003, 2016, and 2019. So you go down the street in Louisiana and one person in six has a disease that's going to cost them their eyes, their kidneys, and their feet. And so what this drew me to was the fact that how we build our environments, how we can encourage people to be physically active was a big driver of this. We've seen children, I'm, as I said, I'm a pediatrician. I was trained at UC San Francisco. I never saw a child with adult onset diabetes. That's what we called it. Now we call it type two. It's now 50% of the kids in the clinic have type two adult onset so-called diabetes. So these big changes. So the big revelation I had during that time was we in public health 
forgot urban planning, forgot design, and we need to go back to it. And people live in environments that make it impossible to walk, that um, the needs for public transportation, the needs for tree cover, the needs for shading, uh, the needs for sidewalks were being ignored was lethal for people. I wrote a policy piece, and this relates to uh, real estate, which is that um, and this came out and I said how we're building America is bad for people's health. We make it hard for people to walk. The, uh, we isolate people in neighborhoods that are uh, an, an hour and a half away from where they work. The kids are often isolated in these environments. And uh, the greeting I got from the National Association of Home Builders was that I was guilty of worse than junk science. And they wanted to have me fired. They had congressmen write to the head of CDC and said, fire that fool Jackson. So, um, yeah, I really came to the conclusion that I had we had to get more data. They didn't fire me, but we had to get much more data. So we began to look at heart disease. The longer you sit in a car, the more your cholesterol goes up, your blood pressure goes up. It's not good for you. Your risk of a heart attack goes up. And by the way, wasting a lot of time, breathing a lot of fumes. Um, we made it hard for kids to walk to school. My kids went to North Springs High School. Um, north of Atlanta and schools have become much, much smaller. My kids' high school did not have a sidewalk within five blocks of it. So um, that change has occurred. And the decline of kids walking is probably a contributor to the increase in diabetes in our kids. We build subdivisions like this, and I'll talk a little bit more about subdivisions because you folks do real estate. But imagine you move to that house on the left and you made friends with the person on the other side of the fence and you said, hey, uh, l let's get together for an Easter party. And I said, sure, come on over and we'll do an Easter egg hunt with the kids. But you actually don't know how to get there because you're new and you can't throw the baby over the fence, the toddler. So you go to Google and you look up and it discover that it's um, seven, um, 17 minutes driving to get to your neighbors on the other side of the fence. It, it's a bit of a joke slide, but where I'm going with this is the last thing we think about it when we build is non-drivers, is walkers, is the elderly, is the people with disabilities, is the poor, is our young people. And we ought to build for a focus of that one third of the population that doesn't drive rather than just car owners. Oh, I'll skip this one. I, I just hate the fact that in many communities in America, we require the homeowner to put in sidewalks. We think nothing of requiring the roads to be fixed by the locality and tax payments, but we don't cover sidewalks. That's a mistake. We should be taxing things that are bad for us. We tax alcohol and tobacco. We should be taxing carbon. We and Instead, we subsidize uh, fossil fuels. In the United States, it's globally about $5 trillion a year in subsidies for fossil fuel extraction and production rather than actually putting a carbon tax on soil. We could use some of that carbon tax to fix the infrastructure in the United States that is in desperate shape. And some of you were on campus when the campus flooded with the 100-year-old water main breaking on Sunset Boulevard. We have paved over some of the finest farmland in the world, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey. This is places that have topsoil 80 feet deep, and yet we're putting houses on top of them. And then people turn around and import food from Chile and South America, where we could be producing much more high quality food local to our cities. Um, and California, you know, this is part of the backbone of the California economy. I always show this picture because it's when I got to be the Secret Service man guarding Governor Schwarzenegger. But um, there's lots of reasons why we should be eating much more fruits and vegetables. And by the way, we have no subsidies for fruits and vegetables, but grain products and corn ethanol, um, which is a sucker's bet for, engineer, um, for energy production, is subsidized in the U.S. We should not be building subdivisions with one exit. This is a recipe for disaster. Coffee Park in, in Santa Rosa that burned in 2017. Um, people had to get out of there fast. Maybe they did get out, but it doesn't help when you build something that no one 100 years ago would think it was a sensible way to build. You'd build in a grid and you could get across a neighborhood and out of the neighborhood relatively easily. We've got to fix the medical care system. And this is my big focus. I'm not talking about climate change today. If you invite me back, I will. But the medical care system is 18% of the GDP, 10% of the greenhouse gas emissions, 5% of the US workforce. We're working very hard to really 
and it's not that we're such an we the medical system are such an important part of greenhouse gas emissions compared to everything else but we can't tell other people what to do to improve health unless we are doing it ourselves we need to think about how we're building our buildings. And here was a study looking at the buildings that survived the violence of Hurricane Katrina down near New Orleans. And you can see these buildings, some of them were built 100 years ago, thick walls with shutters um, that protected so you didn't blow out the surface. And the shape of that roof actually prevents aerodynamically the roof being picked up. You don't want to be in a neighborhood where a 20,000 pound roof is blowing down the street at 70 miles an hour in a, in a thunderstorm. That's a disaster. Big article in the, well, article in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago about the home builders not wanting requirements that foundations be bolted. We Californians know you have to bolt the house to the foundations, but also to bolt the roof to the foundation is extremely important in tornado and hurricane areas. If you build it smart, retrofit is very expensive. Recovering from disasters, as people in Texas know, is very expensive. You ought to build it smart in the first place. Dumb public policy. Here's Florida. They they basically bring in large amounts of fossil fuels and the utility industry there is blocking solar. You can fly into Florida and you can see warehouse after warehouse with no solar panels on the top. I personally think that every building, particularly warehouses, ought to have solar panels on the top. And But you have to incentivize it. They, they have to be able to sell some of the electricity back into the grid. Otherwise, they just do partial infusion. And these places with high sun, and you know where they are, need to have a massive infusion of solar. And I talked about the home builders blocking um, tighter codes to protect homeowners, um, particularly in the face of climate change. So. Uh, I think this is my closing slide, but basically what I want to say is we, our generation, our younger generation, have to do what our grandparents and our great grandparents did. They built for us and we have to do the same for our children and our grandchildren and beyond because what we build will stay around for a hundred years and it's our obligation to the future. UCLA Transportation has done a terrific job. I'm very unhappy the medical center hasn't more, been more forthcoming with the funds to at least incentivize and political pressure to incentivize a bike route between Santa Monica Medical Center and Ronald Reagan. Our interns, residents, nurses, patients, families, and others could bike between the two hospitals in 27 minutes and you've all been on Wilshire Boulevard and spent an hour doing that same trek. So UCLA and particularly UCLA Transportation and I, I don't get paid or anything else. I believe they've done a wonderful job to make our campus much more active, transportation friendly, and we need to really support these efforts and push the medical center to do more. So with that, I'll stop and I really apologize for being late. And by the way, I've given you too much to talk about, but maybe I'll get a question or good question or two. Hi, Bhavna. Hi, Dr. Jackson. It's great to see you. Um, I'm always very excited to hear your um, incredible talks and you kind of pepper it with some of your, um, you know, experiences with, you know, politicians and, and celebrities. And so it's always exciting to see. I, I want to kind of bring you back to something that is really interesting for the folks that don't know um, as part of the <clears throat> our attendees. My background is in public health and I actually worked with Dr. Jackson uh, <clears throat> probably more than 15 years ago um, in Toronto when we were looking at creating healthy built environments and doing some partnerships with the urban planners. And I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts on, you know, the lessons that we've learned over the last 15 years, trying to bridge public health and urban planning and what that could look like for the future in terms of bridging public health, climate change and corporate outputs. And if you have any thoughts on kind of public health, I think, operates within the you know domain of partnerships um, because public health can only you know move so move the needle so far and so what your thoughts might be on on partnerships for the future in terms of kind of addressing some of those larger things like climate change and and health and housing and, and urban design um, the first thing we had to do from the health side was really to create the if you will the corpus of the data because when we wrote that when I got 
you know, the home builders mad at me, I could only find 17 articles in the English language literature that I could find with a Medline search. Can you believe it? That contained either land use, architecture, or built environment and health, partly because it doesn't go back 100 years um, with Medline. And so we really had to work very hard to create that database. And after a while, NIH and CDC and then private philanthropies were putting much more money into the research. So this has stopped being sort of this I used to be a redhead, crazy guys, uh, information, and now is much more uh, mainstream. This has been picked up by uh, many governments. ULI ha and, uh, has a whole active uh, communities thing. AARP, one of the most influential groups in the country, does a lot around healthy communities. Very early on, and I was state health officer, that's why I was with Dr. Uh, Governor Schwarzenegger in that picture. Um, I pushed every county to have at least one person going to the planning commission meetings. And the funny story with that is a nurse would go over to the planning commission meeting in uh, Humboldt, Del Norte County and the planning commission, yeah, yeah, dearie, why are you here? And she, I wanna make sure what you build is uh, good for people's health. Well, that, it, at, after a while, they said, well, no, how can a child walk to this school? How can they get across the street? Um, why isn't there a park nearby? And in the beginning, people resented it, but after a while, they go, oh, well, this is just common sense. So it, it's been a real transition. There are um, many other groups. I would say the research depth is now, and the additive on this has been um, climate change. And I would love to be invited back and really do, go deep on climate because it's uh, something I'm thinking very deep, uh, intensely about now and working on, but I didn't go into it there. But where I want to say there is that many of the things we need to do to improve the climate, eat smarter, less red meat, uh, um, more vegetation, uh, how we build, how we walk, active transportation, public transportation, they're all good for climate as well. So, um, and we're gonna have to spend a lot of money on infrastructure. Uh, I, in preparation for this, I'm spending a lot of time looking at, boy, our, it's it's urgent for our country. My brother has worked and he built ships around the world. He says, I come back to the United States and I feel like I'm coming to a developing country now because, um, our rail, our public transportation, even our airports, et cetera, are so backward compared to Singapore and parts of China and South Korea. So um, I think I, I think it's code blue for, we gotta jump because we cannot sit back and say, oh, we're the greatest country in the world because we are failing. Yeah, Dr. Jackson, we also, um you know, we've, we've seen disproportionate impacts on different communities, particularly with COVID, uh, whether it be crowding and that, that sort of thing. But, um, you know, in, in terms of climate and densities of urban, of, uh, urban environments and things like that, um, you know, what, what sort of things should we be doing to mitigate, um, you know, the, this and address these social equity issues within certain neighborhoods that have very poor outcomes with respect to housing um, in particular? Tim, this is a, probably a long answer, but uh, I've been very involved, at least when I lived in LA, on uh, the Los Angeles River, 54 miles um, and the below the city, as you know, south of the city, it goes through the poorest communities that have the least amount of parks, the least amount of services, and many of the poor people there are biking on uh, surface roads in the dark in the winter when it's raining to get to jobs downtown, and there has to be... I feel very strongly there has to be a safe bike route to get people back and forth to where they need to go. And by the way, the mental health benefits, the environmental health benefits from that are substantial. Um, but there's gonna have to be a lot of community engagement because you, you start making that area very attractive and it's gonna bring in folks with deeper pockets. It's going, I, it's going to create this, you know, a certain amount of gentrification is okay. You want better services and a bit more beauty, but you don't want displacement. You don't want people that have lived in a place to be displaced. And it, ha it means that the leaders have to be very aware of this and there has to be serious dialogue where people can say, you know, I, I'm part of this decision about what needs needs to do, what we need to do. Um, you asked a big question, we're gonna come up with a narrower answer, which is uh, the National Academy of Medicine ran a two day session in August or September on building design. And, and there were a lot of lessons learned from the cruise ships, which around COVID and it's 
cruise ships. Well, I regulated the cruise ships when I was at CDC, the health part of it. And um, the ships, we spent all our time thinking about water and sewage and the galleys and food, and we did not spend anywhere near enough time thinking about the ventilation. And the people that went in and looked at those cruise ships that had a lot of illness, they, they were re-entraining air from one room to another, or from the hallways, et cetera. So the redesign of air handling systems is going to be extremely important. Um, the good news is that the heat pumps are now extremely efficient and heat exchangers are extremely efficient. Many of the hospitals have gone to one pass. In, for example, hospital rooms, you can ex filter but expel out the if you will, the exposed air, the used air, and bring in fresh air. I think we're going to have to do this with schools. I mean, there's a, as you all know, in LA, you're not supposed to build schools within, I think, 250 yards of a freeway. And God almighty, what's not within 250 yards of some kind of high pressure road? So I do think a lot of our buildings are going to have to be under positive airway pressure with um, good quality air coming in. There's lots more to talk about on this one, but those are a couple of quick answers. I'm going to give you very bad news, which is I don't think we've seen the, the end of uh, infectious disease, outbreaks, etc. I I think we'll be nowhere near as extreme come summer, but I think this is going to be around for a long time, these threats. Yeah, and unfortunately, we have seen, we've, we've also backed studies here at UCLA on uh, f freeway proximity, and they tend to be, unfortunately, in poor neighborhoods um, without the technologies to mitigate some of the air quality. I did have another question just about climate change, um, since we did build this as a climate change uh, seminar. Um, you know, a lot of, you know, the question is sort of, do we need to think about how to mitigate uh, and reduce carbon emissions? Um, or do we need to actually think about living with it because it's here for a while? And so we've certainly seen with, re with respect to wildfires and the it, terrible air quality uh, that we breathe and we've seen heat deserts and, and again, some of the urban areas without tree canopies and things like that. Um, but, you know, what, what should we be doing to try to mitigate? I mean, so some of these places that have burned down, should we not be rebuilding in those places? So there'd be certain places where the built environment doesn't belong. Uh, how do we think about receding uh, shorelines and, and things like that with respect to, um, you know, living with climate change and um, and how that might impact markets, particularly real estate markets. Tim, and I apologize I, that I didn't dive deep enough into climate, but I, I will next time. But Sure. Um, one is that somehow Americans think we have a God-given right to build anything we want, anywhere we want, and not being in, in harmony with our environments. And we're going to have to think a lot more about it. So those... Um, uh, those buildings I showed you near um, in, down in New Orleans that survived the uh, storm, um, they were built with those first floors had, that was actually a barn and people, um, they expected they would flood on a regular basis. And, um, you know, thinking air conditioning is going to fix all of our problems. Well, one of the first things Trump did was get rid of the energy star. And we really need to come up with far more efficient air handling systems that don't require so much energy. It's another reason to have solar on, on every single house. When it's sunny, at least you can at least get the elect some electricity to cool you off. It does mean that those who are building and developing ought to be building, you know, some of these place, places don't have code for even insulation and structural, not just mere structure, but really energy efficient as well. And I think that's going to happen more and more. Maybe California, I know California is ahead of the rest of the country, but it's pretty backward in a lot of the US. So that's going to be another one. I think over time, and everybody's going to hate when I say this, but I worked in Michigan for a while. And I mentioned Flint. Uh, you go to Detroit and there's one house on a block. And we're going, there are two issues to that. I think we're going to have to move those houses because you cannot provide public services to one house on a block, number one. Uh, but um, number two, that land is suddenly going to become very desirable as the southwestern United States becomes intolerable. It's already happening in Phoenix where the work people, you know, if you're working on a roadway or even doing agriculture in Phoenix and it's now over 115, 120, you can't be out there in the sun and the heat. And they're now doing a lot more of the work at night. And there's lots of problems with asynchronous work where people are working in bright light, 
melatonin effects, cancer, I'm not making this up, your cancer risks go up from uh, asynchronous lighting. And so we're dealing with very different um, environments and there's gonna have to be a lot of research about how to make that work for people. Um, and so, and boy, do I worry about agriculture with that and the poor folks that live in the, in the Central Valley. I did a lot of work on pesticides in my earlier life and um, it's a very tough life out there, as you know. Yeah, we are, um, <clears throat> since we started about 10 minutes late, why don't we, if, if you could stick on for another maybe five or so minutes and take a few questions from the audience. Um, uh, for those of you that have to jump, we under, completely understand, but it does look like we have a significant audience still on. So why don't we go on for another at least five minutes or so um, on questions? I'd be honored. Great. Um, Bob, do we want to take some questions from the Q&A? Yeah, so there's a couple questions that are, um, I think, relevant to what we've been talking about right now. And uh, one of them is sort of how to accomplish this balance between gentle nudges or more monumental nudges versus kind of creating a nanny state with regulation. So the question is, um, the state is facing a housing crunch. And one of the reasons that often gets cited is that there's currently a lot of regulatory hurdles for builders to create spaces. Um, and how do you think about whether the pendulum has swung too far towards regulation and what is a healthy balance between health and development and kind of nudges versus regulation? Do you have any thoughts on that? You know, I, I remember I, I was a state epidemiologist in New York before I came out back to California because I had gone to school out here. And uh, I was there on the first week or so and someone said to me, well, you know, the difference between California and everywhere else is our laws have so many teeth, so much teeth in them, they, people, they can't get their mouth shut. And um, I, I think we have, and I think Biden's looking at this for the US, we need to start at ground zero and think about what are the regulations, what are the things that, can, what's our big goal? Is our big goal to undo some small problem we've seen in the past? Is our big goal to create healthy, vibrant, economically viable, safe places for everyone. And you shouldn't be condemned to an awful environment if you're poor. And in fact, in Mexico, I remember visiting there and poor communities actually had very good environments. And I've seen this around the Mediterranean as well. We ought to be able to create really fine environments for people, even when they're poor. And I think that commitment to, to that would be um, ex extremely important. Um, two is, and I'll be interested in what the commercial real estate people say on this, but you know, Benioff just announced they're not going to occupy the biggest building in San Francisco, namely the the Salesforce Tower, and they're going to have people working from home. And there are at least two high rises in Oakland, big high rises in Oakland, that are virtually vacant. And I think it's probably going to end up becoming I don't know what else they can do with it. They're going to have to, and there's plenty of people um, starving for housing. It's it's just a nightmare. So I think we're gonna have to rethink where we put people. I, I know the rules and stuff, but I worked in New York City uh, for, I spent quite a while there after the uh, Superstorm Sandy and the poor people were clobbered and the rich, many of the extremely rich were owning four and five penthouses. And they were basically investments that they were holding as you know, lock, box, lock boxes in the sky. Uh, and so and so in, in down Red Hook in Brooklyn, I think, um, there were buildings with affordable housing and rich people housing facing out over the bay. And the poor people had to come in a different door and it was really very uh, divisive or the poor people had to commute in two hours to work in these buildings. So I think really a view towards human well-being and equity is gonna be very important. But I think we, we've done so many stupid things about making chemicals that don't biodegrade. I mean, that ought to be absolutely against the law. Get, don't get me started. But there are plenty of things we ought to do that really would make life easier for people. One of my favorite places was Jonathan Rose's uh, place up on a Superfund site in the Bronx that was a Via Verde that had, you know, it had all those things, you know, had different economic incomes. And in fact, I think it was Mayor Bloomberg said, we need to give good developers the red carpet, not um, the uh, heave ho. I don't remember the exact quote, but uh, I think we ought to do everything we can to support good developers. The, the comment you made about uh, kind of think, rethinking where we house people and how we house people actually transitions well into the next question, which is um, essentially about changing the mindset and the culture. So the question is about 
single family homes being so embedded in American culture and still what a lot of people aspire to. So how do we actually create a market shift in terms of changing the mindset, changing the paradigm to make more of the new urbanism, denser or kind of transit oriented living, more of the default um, and less dependency on single occupancy vehicles um, in order to not only address health and chronic disease, but also climate change. There's a lot there. Um, I've been sort of self-reflecting, but I grew up in Newark, New Jersey, and there were, after the war, there were projects, we called them projects, and it was poor people, but it was basically warehousing poor people in a place that was away from downtown. You had to have a car to go back and forth, so it was surrounded with parking lots and no parks, but because they, they started to build them and then ran out of money, about 80% in, none of the, and I hate the term, amenities of uh, vegetation, trees, uh, playground areas, social areas, higher quality windows, a higher efficiency and quieter air handling systems, the quote unquote amenities, which we should not call them, they, their life necessities were completely neglected. And when you don't, when a place doesn't offer you and reinforce your pride, people don't take pride in them. And it's a complicated story. And I, I actually think homogenizing population in any form um, is a mistake. Uh, my, we actually spent some time in a place that was a uh, vacation, a place that had a whole lot of rich people. My wife announced after about a day, God, rich people are boring. And so, um, you know, thinking about how we can create the diversity and energy and joy and, and, and yes, safety and, and pleasure and beauty at the same time is very important. Great. Do you have a final, final question or thought, Tim, or do you want to, Take another. I think that's it for the audience questions that are um, relevant, I believe. Um, I guess, you know, we, we talked about, uh, since we're real estate folks, neighborhood design, and we talked a little bit about it with the transit orientation and obviously the goal there are, uh, to drive down the cost of housing through density, but also um, to get fewer people out of their cars as you just addressed and um, cut down emissions. But, um, you know, not just houses, but how do we think about neighborhoods more broadly, like uh, so that you you address some of it, but making sure that we have walkability and that we have open space and that we have green space uh, and incorporating some of those into the way we actually design our neighborhoods, uh, not just our own dwellings. You know, and, and you folks are more, ex I'm not an expert on urban planner, but the, uh, United States built really good neighborhoods back around 1900, 1910. They were often near railroad stops. There was lots of density and services and stores and civic buildings near the, where the train or the trolley stopped. And then the density went down as you went from that. And the stores, and this is new urbanist stuff, but the stores, uh, the retail had housing for lower income folks or really older folks that are retired that wanted to be close in and people if you got you know, a big family you want to be in a bigger house and, and more space to move around and you want to have a park nearby but we knew how to do this but then we all got in cars and forgot it indeed well i think we are getting close to our time here so i guess we should maybe uh christina did you want to come on and say some parting comments. I just wanted to say thank you so much to Dr. Jackson for joining us today. Um, we look forward to uh, discussing this more um, and all the items and topics that you brought up. There's plenty there to unpack. So thank you so much to you and to everyone who came on. We look forward to you joining both the Zyman Center and Impact at Anderson in our future events. Um, uh, and we hope to keep you updated on all our activities. And, and Christina, I'll send you my slides, okay, so you can mount them up on a PDF, okay? Great, thank you. I did have some uh, requests already. So thank you so much, everyone. See you next time. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Sorry I was late.